Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, is that normal that something like that would happen? No. <laughs> God. Okay. All right. Happening today. Okay. All righty. Talk, talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Welcome to the Wood Whisperer, episode 22. On today's show, we're going to do something pretty simple. Uh, on the end of the last podcast, I decided to do a little live chat between myself and the chat room while I did some finishing uh, and just asked, basically had them ask me whatever finishing questions came to mind. So uh, it's a quick little video, it's very sort of impromptu, but it just shows you the kind of fun that we have in the chat room while I'm uh, woodworking and finishing. So enjoy. Okay, so now while I apply finish to the table, I'm actually going to be in the chat room, and I know I've mentioned the Wood Whisperer Live page and the chat room and live streaming video, and this is just one of the features that we have while we're actually working in the shop, and it's, it's pretty cool. There's a bunch of regulars that hang out in the chat room, and what I'm going to do right now is just answer finishing questions as I apply the finish uh, to this table, so we'll just take a few. And who asked the first question? Stevie asked the first question. He says, what other factors determine what kind of oil oil finishes you apply to the project besides looks? Tongue oil, linseed oil, motor oil. Uh, well, you know what? Besides looks, I mean, really look-wise, they all kind of look the same. Uh, I, would, I think boiled linseed oil is going to be a little bit, um, a little bit darker in the long run. Uh, but other factors, you know, to be honest, I don't really think there are that many. There's a little bit of difference in terms of cure time. Um, Tongue oil is capable of building up to a nice uh, shine if you're determined enough and you add enough coats. Um, but ultimately, I don't really find there to be that much difference in terms of looks or any other factors. Um, so really, I mean, a can of boiled linseed oil should just about cover all of your oil needs. And if you want to maybe avoid a little bit of the yellowing, tongue oil tends to yellow a little bit less over time. But again, that's a look issue, and that was what you said <laughs> besides. Uh, let's see. MC asks, when you paint a project, do you usually prime it first, or does it depend on the wood? I would always prime before painting. Um, I actually don't paint very much, but I would probably say if you're going to paint, you should probably prime every single time. Um, this is hard to finish, read, and ask questions at the same time. How can you successfully layer finishes? Can certain finishes not cover other finishes? Yeah, there are definitely compatibility issues between certain finishes, um, and you just kind of have to think about the properties of the finish itself and whether that makes sense. So if you have a soft finish on the bottom, you know, let's say something relatively soft, like a spar urethane, um, which is a, you know, a high solids finish, and then you top coat that with lacquer. What you're doing is putting a hard shell on top of something that's soft and flexible. So as humidity and the weather and the temperature change and the properties of those uh, materials change, what's gonna happen? The brittle finish is on top of a soft finish. Most likely, you're gonna have cracks. So there are definitely issues um, to be concerned about. It's just figuring out which properties are compatible. Now the opposite, what if you put a hard finish down and you want to apply a soft finish on top of that? That to me is a little bit more permissible, um, but unfortunately with all the different finishes and all the different options out there, it's really hard to, you know, to say for sure until you get an, a specific example. Can you put this on top of this? Um, it's always safer not to mix your finishes and just kind of you know, stick with one finish throughout if you can and plan it all out ahead of time so you don't have to make any, uh, any mistakes. Uh, doing shaker doors uh, was the best way to finish all sides with Valspar. You're doing shaker doors and drawers, the best way to finish them. Well, actually, earlier in this podcast, these guys haven't seen this podcast yet. I kind of showed how to use oil, you know, sort of a uh, oil-based finish or oil varnish mixture, how to apply that. You know, it's pretty much, to me, the easiest way is the wipe-on method, which I showed earlier. Uh, wiping on is kind of a dummy proof way of doing it because you could sand between coats, there's no brush strokes, and you could start to layer your finish from, from coat to coat that way. Um, I'm losing the questions and I don't have access to my mouse, so if I lose it, you might have to ask it again. Uh, let's see. 
There was a question about sanding sealer. I also mentioned that at the beginning of this podcast, that sanding sealer has a component in it that makes it easier to sand. And that's really all, all it does. Uh, and in fact, that component can cause finishing problems down the line um, as far as finish adhesion. So I, I try to actually stay away from sanding sealers if I can. How often do you test your finishes on scrap first? I hear you should always test it first, but in the real world, do you? If it's a new finish, or a new wood, something I haven't done before, yes, I always test it on scrap. Um, at this point, fortunately, I've had a decent amount of experience and working with a, uh, a refinisher in a refinishing shop. I had a lot of exposure to different requirements, different finishes. I had a lot of time to actually play with the stuff, so I've got a decent amount of that knowledge under my belt so I can predict what's gonna happen. But if you're even remotely unsure, um, you, yes, you should test it. Now that's just top coats. Um, for colors, for stains, finishes, dyes, um, or you know, stains, dyes, toner, stuff like that, you almost always want to test that out on scrap first because every situation is going to be unique. Um, yeah, so I mean, I still, to this day, I still practice on scrap first. Now, if it's something that I'm bringing up a color with toner, you know, and I put a base coat on and I need to slowly bring that color up, I won't necessarily do that on scrap because toning just brings it up in light shades from one shade to another. So. I don't usually have to, uh, to be too concerned about that, but again, that's just a factor of experience. What sorts of objects would you finish with shellac? Well, you can finish just about anything. Shellac is actually a decent finish. The most common things that you'll find people do it, uh, use shellac for, are like the insides of drawers, the insides of casework, uh, because shellac doesn't retain an odor. In fact, after about a day, it smells like nothing at all. So on the insides of drawers, it's perfect. It gives you a nice protective finish and it doesn't stink the place up for months. You could use it on um, children's furniture. Children's toys are great places because shellac is technically edible. Um, shellac comes on our uh, candies. It comes on our uh, time release medication. Um, so essentially, it's you know, perfectly edible once all the alcohol um, basically evaporates and the finish cures. So you know, for children's stuff, it's great, um, and, and just classic, you know, uh, you know, classic furniture finishes, like the uh, French finishes and things like that are based on shellac, you know, so you can get some really gorgeous finishes that way. And I like to use it as a sealer and a base coat for other finishes sometimes. Uh, can you use natural shellac between layers of stain if you do not want the next layer to affect the next yeah, basically any time I add color uh, to a piece and I might be concerned about how the finish is going to react to the color, I like to seal it with de-wax shellac, you know, like a one pound cut. Um, if you can spray, it's best because if you wipe it on, you could sort of move the color around, around a little bit, but typically it, it's not really going to be a problem um, unless maybe you're using an alcohol soluble dye, then you got to be careful. Uh, but that's why I like to spray the shellac in between, and it's a great sealer. Uh, shellac is like a universal binder in terms of finishing. Bama5150 wants to say, my name is Bama5150, hi mom. Awesome. Uh, I read about using filler in finishing. Could you elaborate on this a little bit, the reasoning behind it and how it affects the detail of the wood? You know, uh, I can't remember the dude's name, but it was a fine woodworking video that I saw on finewoodworking.com. And this was actually something I talked about on Wood Talk Online. I saw him use this finish on cherry that involved putting filler into the mix. And it was basically what I'm using today, a uh, oil varnish blend. And then he added a little bit of this filler material, an oil-based uh, grain pour filler. And I was actually taken a little bit aback by that at first. But then once I saw how he did it, you know, he basically put it on the, on the surface, wiped off the excess. The whole process actually kind of made sense. What it, what it did was it made the oil finish a little bit more of a viscous material so that it can not, you know, oil will fill the grains, it, you know, I should say oil-based varnishes and things like that will fill the pores, but it's really not the best way to do it. You need more of, uh, you know, something to actually take up that space, a solid to take up that space and those fillers are perfect. So if you add a small amount, um, you can actually fill the grain that way and get a super, super baby butt smooth finish. To be honest, I've never done it before, but I was intrigued by the finishing process. Um, so uh, I probably can post a link for you guys 
uh, to that episode of Wood Talk Online where I, I showed his exact, or talked about his exact recipe and exactly how he did it. Um, but basically the point is it gives you an even smoother surface on an open poured wood. And we're gonna wrap it up with a couple more questions here and we'll be done. What's the best way to prepare woods that generally don't stain well? Well, we talked about the uh, shellac, um, you know, sort of as a pre-stain or a sealer. I mean, the idea is when you've got these uneven absorption woods, it's, it's because the grain is moving in different directions. So just how end grain, when it accepts a stain or a finish, uh, doesn't quite look the same as face grain because it's, it's like a pack of straws. So from the end grain, it sucks that stuff in and gets a lot darker than the face grain. So when you have wavy grain, and you know, that, like figured wood or tiger maple or something like that, the wavy grain, the reason you see that figure is because you've got end grain, no end grain, end grain, no end grain, as it goes through these waves. So when you're dealing with wood like that, you wanna level the playing field by putting some sort of a sealer that actually on the end grain points or the points where it's more likely to absorb material, you seal that up a little bit. And the parts that don't accept as much material, they're not really gonna be as affected by the sealer as the parts that do suck up the material. So a nice coat of like a, maybe a one pound cut of shellac, something like that is perfect for that. Um, and there's other pre-stained conditioners, things like that that you could use on the market, but they all sort of accomplish that same goal. And we'll pick the last one because we don't want to run too long with this. Is it true that lacquer can be stored in your spray gun? If so, how long? Well, it's never a good idea to store anything in your spray guns any longer than you have to. For the life of the gun, for the quality of the finish, it's probably a good idea not to. But when it comes to lacquer, because of the property of lacquer, the fact that it can redissolve even after it's solidified, it's a lot less of an issue. So if you're going to spray something today and you know tomorrow and maybe even the next day, a couple days later, you're gonna be reusing that material, yeah, leave it in the gun, it's no problem. I've gone as long as a month where I've left stuff in the gun and I've gone back to it, hooked it up, sh sh no problem. So um, that's not to say that it might not be the best thing to do and the finish may not be as good as it was before, um, but it can be done, you know? So, and, and I know lots of guys who do it, uh, but in the course of you know, a week or two, absolutely. I wouldn't even worry about it, just keep it in the gun. And I'm gonna answer one more. Yeah, I know I said the last one was the last one, but... Um, uh, what do I do for sap wood to keep the finish even? Well, that's tricky. That's um, really tricky. That's a color matching issue. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. You're not wearing your organic vapor respirator. Are you getting high on this? Um, a few more minutes and I probably will be. Uh, what's the best way to apply pre-cat lacquer in a home shop? Ooh, very carefully. Um, I probably would not do it without ventilation, really good ventilation, and I would probably say your best bet is to just go outside. You know, make sure you're not uh, upwind from your neighbors and you're not gonna cause any problems there. Um, but definitely get outside, still put on your protection. Um, there's really no great way to do something like that indoors, it's just not a great idea. And you don't really want that pre-cat stuff off-gassing as it cures in your shop either. So it's best to spray it outside and leave it outside for hours until it um, does most of its most severe off-gassing. Boy, I said that was the last one a while back. Uh, bugs in the finish? Probably. And that's something you're gonna have to figure out. <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is a home shop doesn't really have that many options, and that's why you have this problem of spraying. A lot of guys go to water-based finishes um, because they're a little bit less toxic, you know, a little bit less um, dangerous in terms of the uh, spray and what it off-gasses as it cures, but it still is dangerous, you know, so spraying is not necessarily the best finishing method for a home shop. Okay, and shellac does start with bugs in the finish. That's a very good point. Okay, that's it. Thank you guys in the chat room. And the whole point here is, uh, if you have time, go check out the chat room. If you catch me in the shop, you can ask me some questions. Um, make fun of me, give me a lot of crap like these guys do. Uh, but check it out, it's at thewoodwhisperer.tv.